I got to my top weight and I was still, I wanted to be vegan. I had heard about vegan and I, I knew about the little boy chicks that got killed at birth because they don't need them for eggs and about separating the mother cow and the calf. And I wanted it. But I was in this awful catch-22 of when I was binging, I just couldn't deal with all this stuff. I'd be at the 7-Eleven in the middle of the night reading the little label, and it would always say whey or egg albumin. And it was just like, oh, heck, just give me the haagen -Dazs. And then when I would try to come out of the binge and you know try to eat right, all the messages were, well, you have to have nonfat yogurt. You have to have egg white omelets. You know, it, it, it's bad enough that you're vegetarian, but you at least have to have some of these animal foods or you'll be eating all carbs. And so it was a struggle. And what finally happened for me to shorten this long story was, I, I you know, I was kind of vegan at home and whoa. I looked down at my daughter in, in her crib and she was just a couple of months old. She was still all on breast milk. And I thought, she's got to be vegan because I want to give her character. I want to give her her peacefulness. I want to give her a sense of justice. I want to give her a life full of love. How can I give her animal products? But of course, that meant I had to stop with the animal products. There are more people who don't look like what billboards look like or magazine covers look like or ultra marathoners look like. And when we tell them that that's what vegan looks like, we're not going to get them to go vegan and the animals will lose. And if we just gave everybody a freaking break about what they looked like and instead simply told them what vegan foods were and not judge them and call them junk food vegans if they ate something that you wouldn't eat, but instead said, great for not eating an animal. You be you, wow, the animals would rejoice and people would feel so good about themselves and it would be great for the environment. So I think this movement has a lot to do with what we put on people about what they should look like, how they should perform, and what makes a good vegan. Any vegan is a great vegan. That was Victoria Moran and JL Fields, and this is the Yogi Triathlete Podcast. The YTP is proud to be sponsored by Health IQ, an insurance company that uses science and data to secure lower rates on life insurance for health conscious people, including runners, cyclists, strength trainers, vegans, and more. BJ and I are currently going through the process, and these guys are legit. The qualification quizzes on their site are super fun and not that easy. They definitely get your competitive side stimulated. So if you want to save for being a healthy human, just like good drivers save on their car insurance, then go to healthiq.com forward slash YTP to support the show and see if you qualify. Welcome to episode 92 of the show. I'm Jess, your host, and this is the place where we share stories of people looking, finding, and living their purpose. Today, we double up on purpose-filled power with two well-known authors, speakers, and professional vegans, Victoria Moran and J.L. Fields. We caught up with these two lovely ladies in LA a few weeks ago in celebration of their newly released Main Street Vegan Academy cookbook. But of course, this show is about way more than recipes. I mean, please, people... Victoria and JL are vegans who make things happen. We couldn't share the mic with them without digging into the how behind how they've created such successful professional lives. They share insight on turning inspiration into action, incredible tips to navigate living in a multivore home, and they point us in the right direction for creating our most favorite dishes in the air of nonviolence and how to do that from listening to our intuitive voice. Yes, we talk about the amazing cookbook, which literally brings a coach into your kitchen. Over 100 completely vegan recipes from graduates of Victoria's Main Street Vegan Academy, including comfort foods, raw foods, troubleshooting tips, FAQs, and menu plans. It's a complete guide to going vegan, and it's for everyone. Meat lovers, plant curious, and full-on vegans. JL is the author of four books, including Vegan Pressure Cooking, Delicious Beans, Grains, and One Pot Meals in Minutes, and The Vegan Air Fryer, The Healthier Way to Enjoy Deep Fried Flavors, and co-author, which would be her four and a half books, as she mentions on the show, with Ginny Messina of Vegan for Her, The Women's Guide to Being Healthy and Fit on a Plant-Based Diet. JL is a newspaper writer, magazine columnist, speaker, culinary instructor, brand consultant, activist, radio personality, 
and fellow MSVA grad, which means like me, she is a vegan lifestyle coach and educator and the perfect partner in this book with the always lovely Victoria Moran. We were connected with Victoria during our Ride the High Vibe tour in 2016, and during our first podcast with her, YTP number 35, I found my heart filling up as she talked about her academy. I knew that I would be there someday, and that someday was last November, and I can say without hesitation that Victoria is the steward of something very special. The Main Street Vegan Academy is a full-spectrum vegan lifestyle training with 300 graduates from 22 countries. We chat a bit about what it includes and all the links to be connected with these incredible women and the Academy are in the show notes. So definitely check those out. Victoria is the author of 12 books, including the iconic Main Street Vegan, which was the spark that lit a flame that has fueled an international movement. She has been vegan for over three decades. She is an obesity survivor. She is a podcaster and she is the winner of PETA's 2016 and 2017 title of Sexiest Vegan Over 50. She is currently the producer of the upcoming documentary from filmmaker Thomas Wade Jackson called The Compassion and Project, which is centered around introducing veganism to people of faith. I've put a link in the show notes to the trailer and also to their GoFundMe page. I recommend taking a look. You guys, this is going to be a very powerful film. To say that we have two powerhouses on our mics today is an understatement. We are so grateful to be connected with such brilliant, compassionate, and influential people in the vegan world. We believe in these ladies and what they bring to our world. We recommend that you add their cookbook to your collection because you will not be disappointed. There is definitely something for everyone. Please use the link in the show notes to buy it, which will also support the YTP at no extra cost to you. And for your high vibe ingredient shopping, make sure to check out Thrive Market, one of our newest partners. Thrive stocks top organic and healthy products at wholesale prices 25 to 50% off and ships straight to your door. The best thing about Thrive, though, is that with every membership purchased, they gift one to a low income family, veteran, or teacher. Go to the blog post for this episode and use the banner ad to get your 30 day risk free trial, no cost, you guys, to save you a ton. All right, that's it. You've waited long enough. It is such an honor to share with you our conversation with two women who ooze vegan street cred, JL Fields and Victoria Moran. Perfect. All right. Well, thank you so much for having us over at this amazing, I feel like it's like the secret garden. It is. I mean, (laughs) what a lovely thing to call it. Yeah. Yeah. Could you imagine all the little secret, amazing nooks of homes that are built into the side of this, this mountain? And so here we sit um, just off Sunset Boulevard, just east of Beverly Hills, which I've never driven through before. That looks nice and clean and tidy. (laughs) It's not too much of a slum. Uh, But thank you, ladies, for having us over. We're up here in LA for the celebration of the Main Street Vegan Academy cookbook. And as an alumni, (laughs) I'm so honored that this is out in the world. I also wish I went to the Academy a little bit sooner so I could have been included in it, but I have a feeling there's going to be another one. Second edition. There just might be. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) All right. Well, I'm in for that. You guys are having a book launch tonight at Mercy for Animals. Yeah. How did you choose that amazing location? Well, actually, Nathan Runkel, the incredible founder of Mercy for Animals, who actually founded Mercy for Animals when he was 15, which I just always kind of pause after that. Um, He was traveling with his book, and he was in New York City, and I said we'd be out here. And he said, well, maybe. He said, I can't promise because this has to be my staff's decision, but maybe we can can, uh, provide a space for you. And that meant a lot to me because my book, Main Street Vegan, back in 2012, that launched the Academy and so many things, was very much sponsored by Mercy for Animals. At that time, they had offices around the country, and so they said if I could go to those cities, they would get me a place to stay, and they would get a lot of people to come to events. So I just feel like Mercy for Animals is one of the many friends of Main Street Vegan and has been for years. And you told a story at the academy that I was at in November that I love so much because I I believe it's it's such a reminder that when we are living out our divine design, this blueprint that we came here to live out, that 
that the universe con conspires to support us, that things fall into place when we take action and we, and we do the work. And you talked about the moment that you received the phone call and you're standing in your kitchen <laughs> that you were able to get the name of your book, Main Street Vegan, because the, the publisher was wanted it to be something else. Yeah. And it was in that moment that you were getting a flood of inspiration for what would come from that. Do you remember telling uh, yeah, that story? Absolutely. And, and that was when I knew there needed to be, well, I thought radio show, we're talking, this was 2011. And I, I mean, I think I may have known podcasts existed in the world, but my thought was radio show. Well, that happened. The Academy happened. There's a production company with a documentary in the works. So yeah, pretty magical. And just yesterday at the airport, JL had one of those. <laughs> We Can were, you share it? Yeah, I was. Um, we were waiting for our flight, and I a woman came up to me and she said, "What animal group do you work for?" And which took me by surprise until I looked down on my chest and saw that I, of course, was wearing my veganism on my chest. And I had, was just in Kansas City on Friday night um, doing a demo for a vegan wings and beer event with uh, two groups called Veg Life Kansas City and Voice for Animals Kansas City. So I had my Voice for Animals Kansas City t-shirt on. And so I said to the woman, oh, well, this I was, you know, I'm a cookbook author and chef and I'm traveling around and told her about the event. And she, we just started talking and then she said, well, what kind of food could I eat if I wanted to do this? And I started, I said, well, what city do you live in? Because I'll just see if I can figure out what grocery store might have like jackfruit and whatever. And she's like, oh, Colorado Springs. And I'm like, wait a second. I live in Colorado Springs and I teach vegan cooking classes. So I can just teach you how to do all of this. And then we made a lunch date for the one, one of the three vegan restaurants in town for next week. So yeah, that's it's, what happens. Yeah. <laughs> it, that's how exactly it what falls happens. together. Well, we were yeah. discussing how... Hi, Bonnie. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Bonnie. <laughs> we were discussing how like Victoria, we became connected and because... I had an inspiration one day that we needed to get the heck out of Dodge, and I and I knew that we were going to be moving out west. I didn't know. I knew immediately that we wouldn't be just hopping on a flight and moving. I knew there was something huge in the middle, and I didn't know what that was, and that ended up being our what we called that ride the high vibe tour to raise awareness <laughs> that living a more vibrant life is within reach for everyone, whether that's cleaning out your linen closet and feeling a little bit lighter or having your first green smoothie, which we had experience with many people along that trip and having no itinerary, let alone knowing where we were gonna live. And then all of a sudden we are ending up in a hotel room in Midtown Manhattan with the wonderful Victoria Moran. And now here we sit in Southern California and sitting with both of you to celebrate your book. What was the inspiration for the book? Because you're a 12 time author. You've written two, three cook. This is my, was my, Fourth book. Yeah. yeah. Fourth book. Yeah. And you and I have four and a half now because my second book just was, was republished this week or reissued. Oh this yeah, week, you were so. talking about that yeah. in November. <laughs> Very cool. A new uh, a a refresh on it, right? Yeah. yeah. So what was the inspiration to bring this together? Whose idea was it? And then how did you two come together on it? <laughs> you know, for for listeners, that was the puzzled look. What came first? <laughs> you know, <laughs> Right after Main Street Vegan, people were telling me, well, now there needs to be the Main Street Vegan cookbook because that's what happens in this world. But I'm not a, a foodie. I'm not a cuisine person. I'm not a recipe creator. I am a recipe follower, as long as you have all of the ingredients. And then I ran into this woman, <laughs> and you can continue. Well, when I think I'd say shortly after we met. So I went through the very first Main Street Vegan Academy. So I am proud to be in the inaugural class. And what year was that? 2012. So a year after Main Street Vegan. No, two Vegan. months. After Main Street Vegan came out in <laughs> April. The first academy was in June. Yeah. This is what I'm talking about. You got to take action. <laughs> yeah. You got to yeah. take action. You can you can plan and think yourself to death. Yeah. You got to take action. This is why Victoria and I are such great collaborators, though, because I don't think any either one of us look short term at anything. Like if something comes up, if someone has an idea, sometimes I freak them out because they have an idea. And by the time they've finished the thought, I have five more things they could do with that idea. And then I need to settle down and like not overwhelm them. But, and I think this is a perfect example because I think Victoria always thought, yeah, you're probably right. It should be a cookbook too. And then we met and I went through the inaugural academy and I was working on my first book at the time and was putting the cookbook section together of the book Vegan for Her. 
And then I started to get really good at recipes and I started teaching cooking classes and then wrote my own book. And then at that point, Victoria started saying to me, every time I would come back, because I'm on the faculty now of the academy, and every time I'd come back, she'd say, we're going to have to talk about putting a book proposal together at some point. And I bet you we talked about that for an hour, a year. And then we were at a VegFest together, VegFest Colorado, and we just were exhausted after two days and went to a hotel room in Golden, Colorado with our laptops. And we just sat down and we're like, what would the book look like? What would the elements be? And we just worked until like midnight or one o'clock in the morning, just jotting down everything. And then we just went our separate ways. And Victoria said, I'll work on this part of the proposal. You work on this part of the proposal. And then I think a year later, we had a book deal. And a year mm-hmm. later, the book is out. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> and that, and it's because you, ju- you just need to start somewhere. And I think that that's the place where so many people dance around and then nothing ever happens. Mm-hmm. So how, what could we say to those people? Like, wh- how do we bridge that gap? Well, I think we also have to be realistic about what's hard and what's easy. And just because something's hard doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. You just need to know maybe there are going to be some fits and starts and detours. So we were both fortunate with this book because we had some stuff behind us. So JL had been invited to collaborate with Jenny Messina, uh, the vegan RD, on Vegan for Her, and she was already a popular blogger. And so she had what they love to call in publishing, you know, platform. And then I had platform with the 12 previous books and, you know, having gone on Oprah and stuff like that. And so you bring these platforms to a publisher, and it's still hard. A lot of publishers didn't want our book, right. but we, we did find the one who did and the one who saw our vision. And in fact, the title is kind of interesting because our title was A Coach in Your Kitchen, and the Main Street Vegan Academy stuff was going to be in the subtitle. But the publisher said, no, we want to draw on the cachet of Main Street Vegan Academy. And I think JL and I looked at each other and were like, seriously? We have cachet? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we got that. Um, but so I think that anybody who wants to do anything needs to look at what they've already done in the world. What do you already have? And very often, we can't see it in ourselves, and we need to ask somebody else, you know, what have I got if I want to do whatever, you know, do a book, start a podcast, start a business? What do I have? What's my capital right now to bring into this? And everybody's got some. And I see this so often with our Main Street Vegan Academy graduates that people come and maybe they're a personal trainer or maybe they're an image consultant or maybe they've been an attorney and they don't want to do that anymore. But what they got from that they can bring into this new thing. So I think really often, you know, it's like, okay, I'm, I'm getting rid of, you know, my old life, my corporate life, my omnivore life. Well, you don't want to get rid of all of it because you bring that in to what you're going to do next, and that gives you your credentials and and, and your capital. I agree. And, you know, I, I know you know that I... I work with a lot of the coaches who've gone through the academy who then want to start up their business and they don't know where to start. And it's exactly that, Victoria, that people, I think, think that was my old life and now it's my new life and I'm going to jump in. And if we don't hone in on what we're already really good at, you know, we were just talking about previous skills and experiences that could be used for your passion. So you might have done web design or social media for a company that no longer is aligned with your values or your ethics. It doesn't mean you can't do it with somebody else. It might not be what you want to do forever. But I mean, to this day, even though my business now has been going for five years, and before I became what I like to call a crazy professional vegan, I worked in the nonprofit sector for 25, almost 30 years. And still to this day, I'm doing consulting, but now I get to do it for the Plant-Based Foods Association. I get to do it for PETA. I get to do it for the Soy Foods Association. So um, so don't throw out what you're good at, but also remember that we're lifelong learners. And I think, I mean, that's one of the things I think that I adore most about Victoria. There are many things to adore about her, but that she's always, <laughs> it's true, you're always taking a class, listening to you know, a book about a, a concept or theory that's new to you. And I think that those of us who have, have, who understand that our learning didn't stop somewhere, 
but that it's always continuous and there's something that we don't know. And that if we're learning until the day we die, there's going to be something new that we did when we were 41, 51, 61, because we were willing to learn a new skill, but never throwing out what we were already good at because the animals need us to use all of those things. They need web designers. They need Mm -hmm. social media people. They need fundraisers. They need culinary experts. They need inspirational speakers. They need yogis to help the animals Mm -hmm. and us and the planet. And it's that big, it's that beginner's mindset, which we, we learned in yoga. It's always having the beginner's mind. Like you never want to be an expert because once you're an expert, then you know it all. And what, what else left is there to yeah. do? Yeah. So it's that beginner's mind, always being curious and being, I guess it's almost checking your ego and saying like, I don't know it all yet, yeah. but I'm going to take steps forward. And I think that's such a valid point that it, there's not a fine line between leaving this job and starting a new job or leaving the vegan academy and all of a sudden quitting you know, your accounting job, and now you're going to be an advocate for animals. Like, there is a transition period. And I I think what we come across a lot of times is people want that fine line. They want everything to be set up perfectly ahead of time. They want the cookbook. Okay, now I can start eating. No, you can make progress. You can start to make progress. Like, add in things to your lifestyle, whatever that is, your job, your food, your nutrition, Mm -hmm. exercise. I can't, we can't say it enough with the exercise. People just want to like, January 1st, I want to start. Yeah. And we're always like, why not today? Right. Like, or they want to today? do a marathon and it's like walking's beautiful too. Right. right. We're in this society where it just has to be the most. Like it's right. it's like I was this and now I'm gonna be this. And you could actually just be walking along the way to to wherever you're gonna mm-hmm. get. And maybe there'll be a marathon later, or maybe, maybe walking not. three miles a day is beautiful. Right. <laughs> and we always think that we're gonna not try hard enough, mm. but we really overtry, certainly in this culture. I'm gonna be teaching mm. some Uh, yoga classes in my building and I was thinking about you know some of the things that I'm going to be saying in the beginning and it's going to be do less because in our culture it's like oh I I can bend further than her I could stay up longer than no just how about I'm going to bend not as far as her and just see what that feels yeah. like. Yeah, we've already touched upon so many yogic principles in here, but the one that you're touching upon now is one of the laws, uh, the spiritual law, which is you know maximum benefit for the least amount of effort. Yes. That does not mean just lay on the couch and hope an agent's going to call you and mm-hmm. say, oh, hey, I <laughs> just felt you laying on the couch and you wanted to write a book. You have to do the work. Right, yeah. But it's... it's um. I think where the least amount of effort comes in is the emotional tie-in. Like, it has to be like this, and it has to go this way, and I have to have my first book by, you know, this, and and I can't do my corporate life anymore. I have to go all in, or nobody's going to believe in me. And and all of these emotional attachments that we have to these dreams that we want to create in our lives, when in fact, if we just move from moment to moment take action in that moment, like we all have to create things in our lives, take action in that moment and then say, okay, here's where that action took me. Now what's the next step? Yeah. You know, and, and also, um, this idea of the beginner's mind is huge. I wrote a blog post about this years ago and I have it in my yoga notebook, which actually have in the car. And it's like etched in my first page. Like it's actually like I drew, bore the pen through several pages because I could not understand when my teacher wrote, I don't know is the highest state of intelligence. I was like, wait a minute. I don't know means I don't know. And if I don't know, (laughs) that means I know nothing. And if I know nothing, then nobody's going to think I'm important. And I, and, and in this blog post, I say, no, thank you very much. I'm just going to stick to the few topics that I know really, really well and manipulate every conversation. So they come around those and I feel like an expert. And that shifted my entire life to be like, it's okay. It's, it's not even okay to say, I don't know. It's, it is a high state of intelligence. And when we sit down with clients, whether that's athletes, whether that's people we're working with on, on vegan nutrition, um, yogis, whatever it is, we go into it and, and we have a conversation. We say, all right, like, let us have it. What do you, what do you want to know? If we don't know the answer, we will do our darndest to, to find one that works for you. And boy, does that open up so many channels in your life? Cause I think when we say like, that's a hard limit. And hard limits will put us in these cages and, and they don't allow us to 
uh, act on that inspiration, which at that moment may seem crazy. When you were standing in your kitchen and they told you that you have the title of your book and all of a sudden you're thinking about an academy and a radio show and all this stuff, like, well, in that moment, doesn't that seem a little crazy because the book's not even published yet? But you didn't sit, you didn't shut it down. You know, you let it build and you fed it. And now look at where we are today. It's amazing. The, the, the difference is, I always say that we're all teachers. And here you are taking this action, Victoria, creating this academy, JL becoming not only an alumni, but also now a faculty member. And your presentation was so powerful to me as an entrepreneur. And now you're creating teachers. That to me is one of the most exciting things. That's so exciting. Since my daughter has told me I will never have any grandchildren, that <laughs> I have all these amazing graduates. We have three hundred now. There'll be three twenty after the the April course. Oh my gosh! They're in twenty two countries. I mean, we have graduates in, in, in Tanzania and Australia and a young woman who's an NYU student now, but she'll be returning in two years to Saudi Arabia, carrying this message. So I, we know this is a global movement, but just to know that some of my little graduates are seated mm -hmm. in this global movement is really, really exciting. And then I think one of the other things that's great, whether you go to Main Street Vegan Academy or whether you just get yourself connected in this vegan world online and, and through meetups and whatever, is people are so creative. It's almost nobody just says, okay, I'm going to be a vegan now. I'm going to eat this food. I'm going to like animals. And that's it. They always come up with these wonderful other ideas to get the message into the lives of people with particular interests or particular needs. And I think that's why we're growing so fast right now. And we're creative beings. We are creative beings. At the core of who we are, we are creation. We are creative beings. But creation, like our creativity, really comes from this attention to the present moment when we're just fully available for what it is that we're doing. And so anybody that says, oh, I'm not creative. I could never start an account. I could never do it. I could never write a book. I'm not creative. That's a lie. We are all creative beings. And what I've learned by stepping out and being vulnerable and realizing that I don't always have to be right or win the conversation, which opened up so many pathways in my life, thank goodness, is that I have unique gifts and I get to share them. And JL, you have unique gifts and you get to share them. And Victoria, so do you. And everybody who's listening to this, we come into this world with these gifts. We are creative, miraculous beings. And it's it's bridging that gap between the inspiration and the action and and knowing that if you can if you can hold something in your mind, if you can see it in your mind, it can it can become a reality in some shape, way, or form, you know, the essence of what it is that you want to create, we can create this. I think it takes leaders like you two leaders so that we can all look and say, okay, if they can do it, I can do it, you know? And if I can sound a little contrary, I'd also say that there could be people listening right now who don't think of themselves as a creative, and I don't think they need to think of themselves that way because I think a lot of what we do I mean, because we're talking about books and podcasts and things like that. But there are people who anybody could have had that conversation with Bonnie at the airport yesterday. Mm -hmm. But I was equipped to do it differently because I went through the Main Street Vegan Academy. And I knew to meet her where she was. And she wasn't saying she wanted to be vegan. She was attracted to my shirt because it, she loves animals. And through that conversation, I just kind of knew where to meet her, not to pound a message in that she didn't ask for but to be kind and compassionate. And that didn't take a creative bone in my body. And I think a lot of people can go back into their communities and literally go through some kind of training that helps them communicate a message and just simply continue having conversations. And they're doing as much as somebody who published a book. Exactly. I, I totally agree with that. And I think listening is everything in our ability to, to be able to meet people where they're at. Mm -hmm. And sometimes when I'm talking to people because, um, of course, we're so full of information and we're so full of passion, right? <laughs> um, I know I am. And sometimes it gets me into trouble, but I learn from those moments. But there's times where I'm, where I'm speaking with people or having a conversation, I can just hear myself saying, just listen. Mm -hmm. Just listen. Listening will give you all the direction you need. But, again, taking action to further your 
your field, like, f- like going to the Main Street Vegan Academy was, I had a couple of people that said, you know, why do you need to go there? You're already kind of working with people. You're already eating vegan. You're, you're recording recipes and everything. But I was, I just, my answer was that I was just called and I knew about it. I was kind of drooling when we were talking about it in that hotel room in New York. And I knew that I was going to be a part of it. And boy, it is, it is, I'm just going to plug the Academy. <laughs> Because it is something else. Mm-hmm. I mean, there is not one stone un- left unturned. It, it, I mean, Dr. Milton Mills, please. Amazing. Um, Fran Costigan, JL Fields. I mean, oh, J- J- I was just talking about Joshua Ketcher mm-hmm. the other night. Fashion, nutrition, um, medical perspective, business perspective, working with clients one-on-one. Uh, your presentation, Victoria, was beautiful on compulsive eating and, and how to work with, with you know, people who have these types of food issues and understanding the difference between um, you know, a food issue and a compulsion. I believe, not sure if I'm using those words correctly, but it was so full spectrum that it just unfolded so many more layers to what I'm able to offer. And so not thinking or believing that, okay, well, I already know it all. I don't need to go to this training, but listening to those callings that we have to take action and continue to follow through with what it is that's calling us. And if you don't know, this is actually a good question that I have for you guys. The people that are listening, they're like, oh, great. Yeah, it'd be nice to like, but I don't, I don't want to be a teacher and I don't want to be a book writer. I don't even know what I want to do. All I know is that I need to pay my electric bill on Friday. So those people who don't know what it is that lights them up. I think sometimes we're afraid to know because we think we don't deserve it. So for somebody who's like, I don't know, you do. If you just sit quietly, which is, of course, very frightening. In in our culture, we're not really allowed to sit quietly. I mean, I've seen um, when you're on hold on the phone, it's never silent. You walk into a little cafe where you just want some tea in the afternoon, and there are going to be sports and news and all these (laughs) things coming at you from several TVs. So to really be quiet is, is scary, but once you get past that... And you can kind of see, what's my thing? And it's usually the same thing that was your thing before you were seven years old. And one of the things I tell people is think back to that little boy or little girl that you were before you were seven years old. What did you love? And I know exactly what I loved. I loved memorizing my little children's books and getting up on what I thought was a stage. It was really um, four stairs that led down into my dad's medical office. But I would get up there on what I thought was a stage, and I would recite these children's books. Okay, what do I do now? I write, I speak. It's, it's pretty obvious. So go back and, and, and remember this little person and see what you can relate to there. I love that. Yeah, it makes sense when I look back. Yeah, I'm what trying to scratch my head. I don't know what I was doing when I was seven years old, but I'm going to find out. I'm going to call my you mom. You were grinding the tomatoes in the kitchen, <laughs> making homemade Picking tomatoes. Rocks in the so- garden. <laughs> sorting rocks in the garden. Enduring. There's- Enduring. There you go. Mm. Now you're an endurance mm. sports coach. <laughs> Perfect. Now, JL, I I want to I want to um, back up the truck a little bit. Um, plant like your vegan stories, and so what. What brought you know, I do want to get into a little bit more about the cookbook, but I want to hear your backgrounds. And Victoria, and I know yours, and I'm going to ask you to share it again because I think your story is so ridiculously powerful. Um, <laughs> not that you, not, not that yours is not, <laughs> because I think that anytime we, um, I mean, I know that mine was really powerful and it continues to get even more and more powerful, and they're all so unique. So I love to hear the. Um, origin stories of what took you away um, from eating animals? Well, I have a um, two-part story. One is more dramatic than the other, um, but not, not you know, earth-shattering. I, so in my late 30s, so I worked in the nonprofit sector uh, for years, right out of, out of grad school. And in my late 30s, I was running an international foundation to end violence against women and girls. And we were in Africa opening a safe house for girls who were fleeing female genital mutilation. It was in neurokemia. And it was a a gorgeous celebration of mostly women and and women from the Maasai tribe um, were there. 
And during that celebration, a male elder came in, came into where their dancing and music was going on. And the, the women leaders were, were like elbowing each other. Like they couldn't believe he was there because that was a male elder saying, we're going to support you no longer removing the clitorises from young girls. I mean, this was huge. And then he was leading in his most prized possession, which was a goat. And they said, this is like bringing in his car and he's giving it to us. So it was very exciting. And then they slaughtered the goat and they stewed the goat and they served the goat for dinner that night for the celebration. I'm a girl from Iowa. It's not like I knew where I, I knew where meat came from. I was a meat eating, you know, gal going to Africa, and there was just something about meeting that goat, basically looking it in the eye, shaking its hoof, and then eating it. And I was that was it. That was the last time I ate meat. And I called my husband on my way to South Africa the next day, and he was doing the cooking in the house at the time and I just said I'm a vegetarian <laughs> and he's like okay I'll take care of it and by the time I got home he was pressing tofu and making vegetarian meals and I was vegetarian for eight years and then I just had this um I used to be notorious January dieter um so you know you name it I did it Atkins South Beach Weight Watchers and one January it was a 16 day cleanse with my yoga instructor and uh, she had me do no wheat, no dairy, no alcohol, no sugar, something else delicious. Caffeine, <laughs> coffee. Did I say coffee? Yeah. So basically everything I loved, I didn't do for 16 days. Um, and the good news is five of those things came back into my life. Um, but I had realized for 16 days that I had been eating vegan and I didn't even, it didn't occur to me while it was happening. So I'm like, okay, cool. That was easy. I'm a vegan. And I went home and told my husband I was a vegan and he's like, okay, you're on your own now because I do not know what to do with that. So that was when I started cooking for myself and learning how to be vegan. And that was when I was 45. And you weren't even, you weren't even cooking. And now here you are a chef. I mean, you've done some training, but I, I think the shift of your husband, like, okay, good, I got it. And then once you became vegan, when really, <laughs> when really, when you think about it, the only difference is getting rid of the eggs yeah. and the dairy. All of a sudden it's like, I think it's it's really like what do you do without the eggs? Yeah, we get yeah. that all the time. What or do you just do what do you do in general? Yeah, I mean, like what do you? Yeah, you just have an iceberg. Yeah. Lettuce oh my salad. gosh! Yeah. And I've been there. Like I've yeah. been there. Yeah. I think a lot of us have. You know, we've been doing this now for seven years, and we're really good at it now. Yeah, we're really good at making very hearty, gorgeous, nutrient dense meals. The first year or so, like we got our blood work, it wasn't all that great. Yeah, it wasn't all that great. Like it, I mean, it was healthy by all, I guess, American standards. But I look at it now and it's like whew, solid, yeah. you know, really optimal um, levels in our in our blood because we get better at it. Yeah. But we, well, and by the way, Dave's vegan now and he does all the cooking at home. I, I cook for a living. I don't want to make a meal when I get home. So I love that. Um, so he's, he's great at it. So how, what was it? How did how was his progression? Well, when I got home as a vegetarian, he's like, cool, I'll do this with you. And I think he was vegetarian for three weeks and we were in Napa Valley on vacation. And I'm just watching him at a restaurant, like watching all of these plates go by that he's not going to get to have. And he just looked miserable. And I just said to him, you know, I didn't ask you to be vegetarian. I, I just am. And so then that was his, you know, get out of jail free card. And so then he um, went back to eating meat. And then, you know what really happened was, um, so I always say that I feel like when people are in multi-bore homes and they start to have this discussion around one of you's vegetarian or vegan and one's not, how you communicate that is no different than how you communicate about anything else. So over the years of our marriage, we had all kinds of things that came up that were new. I decided to start to practice Buddhism and he's like, I didn't marry a Buddhist. And like, you don't have to be a Buddhist. I'm just a Buddhist now. And, um, and we had those conversations about respect. And so when I decided to go vegan, I said, you know, here's, you know, I would never ask you to do what I'm doing, but this is how I need it to work for me. I'll never buy meat or animal products again, and I won't prepare them. And so you're responsible for getting your own food and making it, and I'm responsible for myself, and you can have any of the food I'm making. And that's those were our parameters. And so it worked fine. And then as we were moving to from, color, from New York to Colorado Springs, he was the one who said, should we just make the new place in Colorado Springs vegetarian? And I'm like, that's great. Thank you. And I didn't ask him, and I just, and I didn't you know, bow down and say, you're the best person ever. I simply said, thank you. I appreciated it. And then when we got there and then moved to our, uh, the place we ended up buying, he's like, well, we should just make that vegan. So while that's happening, you know, now he's eating vegetarian in the house and then we're in a vegan home. 
And then, um, you know, I drug him to PETA events. He's been everywhere. He knows the facts. He's the first to say he's not necessarily an animal lover. He's a crazy cat guy, but he's not necessarily an animal lover. But when it was when I took him to Cowspiracy and we were driving back from Denver and he looked at me and he's like, okay, he's like, I guess I'm vegan. And so I refer to him as the reluctant vegan. He's like, if you, <laughs> if you, if you saw us in a restaurant and you said, oh my gosh, you guys are vegan, I'd be like, yes. And he'd be like, yeah. Um, and it's not like I didn't bully him into it. It's just the facts are undeniable. So, um, so he doesn't necessarily, you know, wear the vegan t-shirts all around, but he would, <laughs> could, couldn't imagine not being vegan because of what he knows. So. <laughs> well, and it's reminding me, I'd mentioned Eric Lindstrom Eric, yeah, before we sure. turned on the mics and he had written the book, uh, Skeptical Vegan, and we had the pleasure of interviewing him. He's such a funny guy. He's hilarious. He's and hilarious. The book is so funny. It's so funny. <laughs> the book is great. Yes. Yeah. You, I, I loved what you said about it. You were like, it's something like, it's so funny. You don't even realize it's changing your life. Exactly. Yeah. It was such a perfect line. And in the book, he has his was it was his T-shirt the reluctant vegan or the skeptical vegan? Skeptical. I can't remember. Skeptical. Well, his wife bought him. And the whole thing's about a bet. Who's gonna yeah. you know lose the bet's got to do the chores in the house. So here he is, like laying on the couch, having dreams of Jen scrubbing the floors while he's eating like prime rib. Like I'm gonna win this bet, and the bet's still going. Yeah. They've got vegan babies. <laughs> they you know they've been vegan now for I think like six or seven years. Book out. And yeah. he would go to the macrobiotic dinners up in Ithaca, which are like a real deal like Colin Campbell's going to those you know and he would wear his skeptical vegan t-shirt at yeah. these vegan dinners and there's a lot of you know the yeah. ethical vegan population is very strong up there and it was beautiful because we were able to experience it when we stayed there and he was just so brave he was like I'm just doing it for this bet but you know <laughs> as soon as I win the bet I'm done and uh and that reminds me of your husband Dave <laughs> like but it doesn't matter to me. It's it's almost like yoga. Like if you want to, it's not my deal, but if you want to go to yoga and drink beer, which is kind of the new thing, like I'm not going to teach it. I'm not going to go to it. But if it gets you to the yoga mat, okay, good. Or, you know, if you want to go to the rock music yoga class or whatever, it's an, it's an access point. So every time somebody eats vegan, you know, we get to celebrate. Yeah. This one meal. So I don't care if they're reluctant yep. or not. It doesn't matter to me how they yep. feel about it. They're yep. eating a complete nonviolent meal, which to me is we need more of that in the world. You know, if we look at um, Will Tuttle's world peace diet, which just makes so much sense, you know, just removing the violence from the world yep. uh, is, is, I believe, what, what we're all crying out for. So, Victoria, will you share your story? Oh, Wow. <laughs> I get. I'm feeling like I want to share my husband's story because. Well, I'm, I I want to hear that too because he's had quite a transition. He, he has, yeah. So when you were talking earlier about the difference between vegan and vegetarian and how people approach that, I've always used the analogy that being vegetarian is is like being a Mennonite, and Mennonites are very religious and they live more simply than most people. And you know, if you know a Mennonite, this is somebody who's very serious about their religion, but they're driving cars and they're going to work and they're living in the world. But within that Mennonite tradition, we also have the Amish. And we all know the Amish live entirely differently from the way that most uh, Americans and, and modern people around the world do. And, and many do not have cars, do not have electricity. And that's what I think people look at as vegan. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> whoa. And I saw it when I married my husband. I was widowed uh, in my 30s. My daughter was four years old. And I married my current husband when she was 14. And he had three children. Now, he had become vegetarian two weeks after we met. He just put it together. He'd never really thought about that. He'd, he'd gone hunting once as a kid, shot a quail, and that was it for him. I'm never, ever going to take anybody's life. But he didn't connect it to what was on his plate. So after two weeks, he was eating vegetarian, and that was fine. But we're married. We're in the house. And he doesn't want his children, who, you know, a couple years before went through the divorce and all that, to have to make a big change when they come to us. So we decided that there would be a refrigerator for them in the basement, and they would have their pepperoni pizzas and their Lunchables and all that stuff down there. In the basement uh, where it, it belongs. Way, way down. <laughs> you know, it, was, it was hard for everybody. It was hard for me because for many years by, by then... 
I'd had this, what I considered this zone of peace, you know, my home. In fact, I had at one time a, a poster that said, this is a gun-free, drug-free, smoke-free, alcohol-free, meat-free zone of peace. <laughs> well, I had to get rid of that sign because not only in my new life were there pepperoni pizzas and Lunchables in the basement, there were toy guns and violent video games. And I had been, you know, part of Mothers Against Toy Guns and things like that. And I hadn't realized that I had created a little subculture. And, you know, my daughter has told me since, yeah, I thought Coca-Cola was the same as cocaine. I thought it was so <laughs> bad. And it's like, well, it is bad. <laughs> <laughs> it is like <But>, cocaine. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, here's this new life, big transition for everybody, blended families, not easy in any case. But what I realized as we were trying to do this blended family thing was if my daughter and I had been vegetarian instead of vegan, it would have hardly been anything. Mm -hmm. We could have gone out for pizza and had cheese pizza. Mm -hmm. We could have had birthday parties with one birthday cake. But when you're vegan, it's a little bit more and a little bit different. And so ultimately the pepperoni pizzas moved upstairs because that's where the microwave was. And it was so interesting to me. Part of it was, you know, my ego. When I went to the grocery store to buy the things that his kids wanted, the first time I did it, I put my coat over the cart in case somebody saw me. But I always remember what my vegan mentor, Jay Dinshaw, co-founder of the American Vegan Society, told me during the years when I was struggling to be vegan. And I can talk about that if you want to hear it. He would say, this is about doing the most good and the least harm in any situation. And I just had to see at that time that even though I do not believe that there is any justification for killing and eating animals, in that situation, there were these three kids who that was their life. And, and so that's what we did. It was not easy. And so now I live in vegan land. You know, I, I, veganism is my work, and most of my friends are vegan, and I live in New York City where there are just vegan restaurants all vegan over. Vegan heaven. But mm -hmm. I need to remember, you know, that when people are trying to transition, they don't just move to Veganville. They've got to deal with family and relationships, and sometimes it's not easy, but I think it's just to have this as, okay... This is what I am doing a day at a time, or this is what I am moving toward. And I love how JL talks about the negotiations with her husband. And now he's one of us. I know. <laughs> well, and, and my husband too, and I need to say so. He, he went vegan, well, he, he dropped milk. About four years after we were married, we were at a farm sanctuary gala, and he saw a little video about a mother cow and the calf being separated. And he'd never gotten the milk thing before. He thought I was just extreme. And he kind of leaned across the table. I remember we were seated. You know, It was one of these gala things where you sit where they put you. We were actually next to Sharon Gannon and David Life, who founded Jiva Mukti Yoga. And I remember my husband sort of leaned across them and said to me, you think we can start getting more of that milk like you drink? And I'm like, yeah, sure. When inside, I'm going, yes! <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, haven't we all had those moments? But, but he, he wasn't like committed vegan. He just wasn't drinking liquid milk. But then when he read the manuscript from Main Street Vegan back in, in 2011, he called me from a train where he was traveling and he'd been reading it. And he said, okay, now I get it. And he hates having his picture taken and he he's, prides himself on being Google-less. He just doesn't want to be like out there. But he actually asked me, we were out here in LA, we were at Moose Shoes, and he got his final leather thing replaced and he wanted me to take his picture with his two vegan wallets and post that online because that was his statement to the world there is no more leather there is no more wool there is no more anything terrible and it's just sweet but it takes a while sometimes and you know I know the hardliners would say the animals don't have the time you know I get that I really do and I also understand thank God we we give ourselves the time it takes. Mm -hmm. I think it's really important to, like I said, when we first started, we weren't really that good at it. 
we weren't really that good, even though we did it for performance. You know, we were looking mm -hmm. at Rich Roll and Scott Jurek and these guys doing these amazing things on plants, and we were curious. And yes, we were both animal lovers, and it wasn't that we didn't care about the animals, but we just, like so many people, we just didn't know. We just didn't know. We hadn't been educated yet. Of course, we are now, and we're in it fully for the animals. But it's... It takes time and it's an evolution. And it's just like what you said at the beginning, just because it's hard. And of course I look at it now and go, it's not hard because it's my life now. It's my life. So no, I don't think it's hard at all in hindsight. But go back seven years where I'm like, what am I going to make for dinner after a six hour bike ride? You know? And now I know that, geez, just make some beans and rice and tortillas. And that's a really hearty meal. But I think we have this idea that everything has to be, you know, um, this big production in the kitchen and it doesn't. But like you said at the beginning, just because it's quote unquote hard doesn't mean that you shouldn't do it. You know? And, and so what is that next step? What is that next step? As a natural born vegetarian, for me, it was getting rid of the cheese. And, you know, and that just came out of a moment of like, well, I'm going to try this salad without cheese. And our <laughs> listeners have heard this story so many times, but it really is. There was a moment of inspiration of, and I took action on it. I'm not going to get cheese. Now in that moment, I had a, almost a panic attack. Like, how am I going to ingest the salad without goat cheese, which is my favorite. I will surely die. My bones will be brittle by nine o'clock tonight. <laughs> But then what happened was 10 days later, after I kept doing that, because I eat cheese with every meal and cheese in between meals. And what happened within 10 days is I had no allergies. Mm -hmm. I had no skin irritations. I lost weight. like, And I don't have a lot to lose. But within a couple weeks, I had lost 10 pounds, never gained that back. I think that was just all because I ate so much cheese. Well, <laughs> well, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. And, um, and energy. Already a very healthy person, we were very active, racing Ironman, you know, eating well, quote unquote well, and the, my energy, it's not like it went through the roof, it was just sustained, you know, that doesn't mean that I don't have days where I need naps, I'm probably going to need a nap today, but things changed, what I'm saying was like things changed and I, and I just, I made a choice that I wanted to feel like that. And some people confuse hard with different. Yes. And so I think that um, it might seem hard to make those change, but what you're, what, it, what you're really facing is that you need to do something differently. Like when people say, um, you know, a lot of the vegans, we want to roll our eyes when people ask about where do we get our protein, but I never roll my eyes mm -hmm. at that question because A, I had the same question, mm -hmm. and B, that isn't the question because one answer could be, well, I don't know how much do I need? And most people wouldn't know what that answer is. What they really mean is you've just asked me to in rethink my entire plate. So not, they're not asking where to get your protein. They're saying, what do I put on that plate that's not chicken or salmon or cheese? Um, and so um, it's just different. And so I think when we approach it to say it's hard, but we're going to make it uncomplicated for you. That's not the answer. It's it's going to be, it's different, and we're going to show you different options. And that really is what the Main Street Vegan Academy cookbook is all about. Whatever you eat, however you eat, there are going to be ways to find out the different way to do it, which is, is, is super easy, just different. And I think it's so true with the cooking. You know, when you really think about how hard it is to cook meat, it doesn't seem hard if you grow up, you know, and your mother cooked and you learned from the time you were little. But when you think about how, how clean you have to keep your counters if you're eating chicken. You almost have to have like a hazmat unit, you know, in your, <laughs> your kitchen. And and the idea of, you know, making a roast, or, I mean, this, this is a big thing. And so then we come to vegan and it's like, these beans are all dry. <laughs> what do I do with them? If you're not used to that, tiny little learning curve, what to do? For me, even dark leafy greens, you know, veganism has evolved. It's interesting. We know we evolve personally, but, but veganism has evolved too. And when I became vegan back in the early 80s, it was a very brown way to eat. There was a lot of macrobiotic influence, and it was the idea that we would kind of have onion soup and lentil loaf and nut patties and brown rice, and it wasn't unhealthy, but it wasn't vitality. It wasn't vibrant. And so even though, I mean, I had salad and I had broccoli, but in terms of things like collards and kale and all these things that we know now are so good for you, 
I'd been vegan for years before I ever had that. I, I learned about dark leafy greens at an Ethiopian restaurant here in LA, and my daughter was so in love with Ethiopian food, I had to learn how to make it. But I'd always just passed those particular items of produce at the store because I didn't know what to do with them. But now there's so many ways to find out what to do with vegetables, what to do with beans and grains. And do you have to eat everything? Do you have to eat every kind of weird, strange thing somebody talks about? No. You can do this from a regular grocery store with foods with which you're familiar, but after a while you're going to want to try some of the other things just because you get really interested and excited about it all. And the... I know I will track back to your story um, because you had touched upon something about how you struggled with being vegan, and I want to share that. But since we have the cookbook on the table here, uh, figuratively, there's so much diversity and there's so many different flavors because you've got so many different chefs. And that's what I love about it is that you've got, you know, my favorite's going to be different from your favorite and the way that I approach something is going to be different from the way JL approaches something, which is going to be the different from the way that Victoria approaches something. And so, I mean, maybe this is the first ever book where there is something for everyone. <laughs> it might very well be. You right? You have a hundred, is it a hundred recipes? Over a hundred. And how many? 60 contributors. Wow. 60 a Main Street vegan certified vegan lifestyle coaches and educators. Sharing their unique gifts. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. So there's a lot of flavor in that, but it's not and, just the recipes. And not all chefs. I do want to, it, because I think that's actually really mm-hmm. important. Huge. Um, because it's people, the, the book is called Main Street Vegan Academy, obviously after Victoria's book, The Main Street Vegan, but it's truly designed to represent what Main Street might look like in Burlington, Iowa versus Colorado Springs mm-hmm. versus New York City. And that means, you know, home cooks that wonderful home cooks that aren't cooking vegan now are going to learn from other wonderful home cooks how to cook vegan. And you're going to get recipes from chefs and you're going to get recipes from people in between being a home cook and being a chef. And, and I think that's one of the real strengths of the book. And I think all of us who don't consider ourselves culinary whizzes, which certainly I would say that about myself, we all have a recipe. Everybody's got like, well, I got this from my mom or my grandma and it's really good. And so in getting recipes from everybody, We have everybody's best recipe, everybody's Mm -hmm. best family recipe. So we're drawing on so many traditions and and so many nationalities. For example, we have, is it five dishes that are called lasagna? But only (laughs) one is lasagna like you think of lasagna with with the vegan ricotta and, and the spinach and the noodles. I mean, we have one that has no noodles. We have one that's based on cabbage. I mean, it, it's, they're really unique and different. So it's sort of like if you could just knock on all the doors on a vegan block and get everybody's best recipe, it's in this book. Mm-hmm. And it's not just recipes. What else do you have in there? Well... JL did the recipes masterfully. She curated all of those, and then we also have, I think, over a 1,000 tips. And these Whoa. are tips for cooking, for shopping, nutrition, social interaction. We really tried to make this something, I know know there are hundreds of great books out there and JL and I have written some of them, but if this happens to be the only book about vegan anything that somebody has, it's really complete. And I did the editorial sections about going vegan and about being your own kind of vegan. This was something that we wanted from the very beginning that there are lots of ways to be vegan. I mean, you guys are so into the fitness and that sort of thing, and other people are doing it therapeutically because they're trying to reverse some sort of health condition, and other people, it's all about the animals, or all about the environment. And then we have all these culinary traditions that we come from. And and some people want to be raw, and some people want to be, I just want to have chili cheese dogs and all the things that I used to have, but make them vegan. And we want to honor everywhere that everybody's coming from. And I can say from having been vegan now for 35 years that certainly in my case, it evolves. You know, as you go along, I'm not eating the same foods that I ate 35 years ago, even though I was a vegan then and I'm a vegan now. And you're the expert on your own life. And so what we try to provide in this book, both editorially and with the recipes, is here's the guidance, here's the support, here's what we tell our students and our clients and you're still the expert because you're you. I love it. So it sounds like there's some, maybe some vegan soul food in there and some ethnic dishes and maybe some straight up just 
plants, like real whole food, <laughs> just plant type of dishes. So it's, you know, it, it also um, is a book that you can eat with the seasons, you know, if people like to do that a little bit heartier and in in, with that many recipes, a little bit heartier in the winter time, a little bit lighter in the summertime, raw food, cooked foods. Um, like I said, it might just be the only book that is uh, where there's something for everyone. Mm-hmm. Well, if you're on the proverbial desert island, bring the Main Street. <laughs> I love it. I love it. All right. So I want to um, I want to backtrack because I want you to share your story. But but before you do that, actually, your husband now is raw. Well, pretty much. I'd say yeah. he's maybe 85% raw. Um, it, it's an interesting story in the holistic kind of point of view because we are our whole lives make us who we are. And I think so often it's like, oh, you know, somebody changed their diet. Well, yeah, but when other things are changing too, you get the real revolutionary kind of difference. I think sometimes we give diet maybe more credit than it mm-hmm. deserves because it's just part of life. So... Um, My husband was overworking, and and it was very, very stressful. And last January, just a a year ago, he lost a couple of clients on one day, and that had happened before, and he was going to go get more clients and keep working 14 hours a day and, and being unhappy because that was just the way our lives were working at that time. But after a couple of weeks of less stress, that was when he decided... I think I'm going to exercise more. And he was already doing martial arts. And so he kind of doubled his classes. And then he realized that he could rent some of the space there and go and do more drills. So he started with that. And then within about three to four weeks of of the change in his work life, he decided he was going to start eating raw food. Not so much because he had read about different diets and he thought that was the best one, but he doesn't know how to cook and he really likes fruit. And so it was, I think for people who are familiar you know, with the diet world, he was inadvertently doing Doug Graham's 80-10-10 diet. He just didn't know that. He had a lot of fruit, maybe not 80-10-10 because more nuts than would be 10% of calories from fat, but whatever, mostly raw. And then he'd have dinner with me, uh, whatever I fixed. And what happened for him, this is one anecdotal story, but in his case, um, 65 years old, he lost 70 pounds and his hair, and he hates it when I tell people this because he's shy, so don't anybody tell him that I said this, but his hair had been completely white for about 15 years, and it's brownish in his beard, and there's some gray in it, but basically there is pigment coming back into his hair. Now, I'm a vegan, and I get my hair colored every month. <laughs> and I have gray hair. We're on a radio station. <laughs> so, you know, it's, gray, it's gray, like, gray. But <laughs> what, what my understanding is, and I've talked with some physicians and experts about this, and they say that in very rare instances, sometimes you can shock the body to the degree that it goes, and this is so anthropomorphizing and probably a terrible way to put it, but basically the body says, oh gosh, I'm sorry, I thought you were older. Oops, I'm going to go give you your hair color back. Not often, but I live with it and I see it. And it's, it's really exciting. And the fun part, when we go out in New York City and somebody comes by the table who maybe knows us, they get all nervous. And I finally figured it out. When I'm with my husband and they haven't seen him for a while, they think I have a boy toy. <laughs> and they don't know what the etiquette is for talking to the other man. But there is no other man, just my um, transformed husband. You little tomcat, you. Oh, no. <laughs> I love it. All right, so 35 years you've been vegan. Yeah. What was your, what was your changing well, point? Well, I went vegetarian because of yoga. Started reading about yoga when I was 17. All three books <laughs> that we had that were available at that time. <laughs> and um, I moved to London where vegetarianism was a thing and started actually taking lo- uh, yoga with my wonderful teacher, Stella Churfus, whom I recently re-met. I-, I didn't know what had happened to her. And I re-met her, I guess, four years ago. And she is now 93 
and still teaches yoga. She teaches a swimming class <laughs> and she lives in a fourth floor walk up. I mean, she's extraordinary. But anyway, finally over, over there, I got rid of land animals clinging to fish because I had a history of compulsive overeating and, and weight issues and um, cereal dieting. And when I was in London, I'd gotten into Weight Watchers. And at that time, everybody in Weight Watchers had the same diet and you had to eat fish five times a week. And the message was, if you do that, you'll be thin. And if you don't eat this fish, you know, you'll just, you know, get gargantuan. And it was so hard to let go of the fish because I believed that because I'd lost a lot of weight doing that Weight Watchers thing. And, you know, and when I stopped the, the meat, you know, the rules were you were supposed to have some meat too, but it wasn't this big message like the fish. And so I stopped the meat and I didn't gain any weight. And then it was like, but I knew when I stopped the fish that I would gain the weight. And it's so interesting because what happened... What a belief system. It's a belief system. Yeah. So shortly after I stopped the fish... I went back to binge eating. I can remember being on a bus coming back from a Weight Watchers meeting with two pounds of salted cashews and eating them all by the time I got home. So that's why I doubled my weight in six weeks. But to me, it was see, see what happens when you don't have fish. Um, so I went through all that kind of stuff. And it, was it was like the fish was like your safety to being thin. It was, yes. And when you, and when you let that safety go, it just... I had like, to make it true. When I right. let it go, I, I didn't just immediately gain weight, but I had to put into process the actions that would lead to this outcome because I believed that outcome had to happen. So um, I, I got to my top weight... And I was still, I wanted to be vegan. I had heard about vegan and I, I knew about the little boy chicks that got killed at birth because they don't need them for eggs and about separating the mother cow and the calf. And I wanted it, but I was in this awful catch 22 of when I was binging, I just couldn't deal with all this stuff. I'd be at the 7-Eleven in the middle of the night reading the little label and it would always say whey or egg albumin. And it was just like, oh, heck, just give me the hagen das. And then when I would try to come out of the binge and, you know, try to eat right, all the messages were, well, you have to have nonfat yogurt. You have to have egg white omelets. You know, it, it's bad enough that you're vegetarian, but you at least have to have some of these animal foods or you'll be eating all carbs. And so it was a struggle. And what finally happened for me to shorten this long story was I, you know, I was kind of vegan at home and whoa. I looked down at my daughter in, in her crib and she was just a couple of months old. She was still all on breast milk. And I thought, she's got to be vegan because I want to give her character. I want to give her her peacefulness. I want to give her a sense of justice. I want to give her a life full of love. How can I give her animal products? But of course that meant I had to stop with the animal products. And interestingly enough, right around that same time, I had had recommitted to the Overeaters Anonymous program, which doesn't have to do with food. It just has to do with changing them inside out so that I would not need to eat for a fix. And those two things coalesced so that vegan and not eating for a fix entered my life at just about the same time. And the rest of the weight came off without dieting or being weird about it. And that's my truth for 35 years. And I know everybody has their own story, but that one's mine. And yeah, the, the weight loss. JL, you said that you were like the classic January 1st dieter. Mm -hmm. How, that's obvious. That, I mean, I'm thinking that shifted. No. Yeah. <laughs> so you don't diet anymore because diet, well, what, what's your being the classic January 1st dieter, what is your perspective on those kinds of things now, like dieting? Oh, I wish we had another hour because I'm actually going to probably tell you something you're not going to expect to hear. And I haven't talked about this, but, um, so first off for the, I've been vegan for eight years. And I've been the chubby vegan. I was a skinny um, marathoner, half marathoner, triathlete, but I was also a meat eater. And the re reason I was a size two was because I ran, you know, 10 half marathons a year and ran marathons. And um, 
Then I went vegan and uh, fell in love with vegan food, fell in love with vegan cooking, and decided that I didn't need to run all my weight away. Um, I wasn't motivated to do marathons for any other reason than to be skinny. And so I gained weight and um, was a very, very happy, chubby vegan, very happy. But we are in an interesting time with veganism right now and people who eat plant-based versus vegan and what's acceptable is what a vegan size should be. And I'm a lightning rod on social media. People go after me. They write reviews about the fat auth cookbook author um, and judge books by uh, the size of the author. And I'm not immune to those things. So I've actually lost weight this year. And someone said to me recently, you look great. You must be so happy. I'm like, actually, no, I was really happy fat. <laughs> <laughs> I was really happy not worrying about those things. Um, so, so my opinion is this. There are more people who don't look like what billboards look like or magazine covers look like or ultra marathoners look like. And when we tell them that that's what vegan looks like, we're not going to get them to go vegan. And the animals will lose. And if we just gave everybody a freaking break about what they looked like and instead simply told them what vegan foods were and not judge them and call them junk food vegans if they ate something that you wouldn't eat, but instead said, great for not eating an animal. You be you. Wow. The animals would rejoice and people would feel so good about themselves and it would be great for the environment. So I think this movement has a lot to do with what we put on people about what they should look like, how they should perform and what makes a good vegan. Any vegan is a great vegan. Agreed. Mm -hmm. And I felt a little bit of that, you know, sometimes we get, we get tied up in, in our, in our, um, we'll put it this way, yogi triathlete, right? Mm -hmm. When yogi triathlete was born, I was full on into triathlon. I sold my bike. I don't really, I don't have a desire to go swim in a freezing cold pool with BJ <laughs> this morning. Like I just don't have that desire anymore. And there's been, so I'm equating this to kind of the pressure that we can put on ourselves about weight and looking a certain way is that I feel like, oh my gosh, now that Yogi Triathletes has momentum, we have a global audience and all of this stuff. Well, you know, the girl who, you know, one of the people who started it isn't even a triathlete anymore. And so I've, I've, that's weighed on me. And I thought, but, but for me, so, so, but underneath Yogi Triathlete, it's like finding our truth and finding out why I am here and what I'm supposed to do while I'm here and how can I align that path with my inner joy. And right now to go out and do a six hour bike and, you know, swim in a freezing cold pool, that does not bring me joy. <laughs> that does not bring me joy at all. And so I've, I'm not at, you know, 110 pound Ironman race weight at this point. I'm probably about eight pounds heavier than that, but I feel good mm -hmm. in my body. And I'm just, a, I'm a little, but I've got some curves and, and through my practice of yoga and meditation and, you know, wisdom of, of every year I live on this earth, we we get more wisdom. I'm happy where I am. And I think that's the message that I really want to portray is that, you know, when I first started triathlon, I was running from myself. And now I've met myself through merging triathlon and yoga and those practices together. And now I realize, ha, huh, you know, but that doesn't mean that I'm not immune to, oh my gosh, I've created this. Now people aren't going to believe in me, right. but what's underneath it is the whole thing about believing in ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so that's where the, that's where my work is. It's just like believing in, in, in moving forward where I am aligned. Mm -hmm. And for BJ, you know, doing these, you know, competing at the top of the top, that is what's so aligned with mm -hmm. you. This is what brings you joy. And what now brings me joy, which it didn't before is like, now I get to just kind of lift him up yeah. in that way because I have time now. Mm -hmm. Whereas before it'd be like, no, I'm doing a race that day. No, you can't do the race that day. Oh, great. Now nobody's going to even be able to yeah. eat because <laughs> we're going to be too tired. Laundry won't get done. Now we're both Nothing. racing this Iron Man. And, and That's so, a job. Yeah, it, 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 is, it is. This ability to transform with ourselves. Yeah. And meet and not, like you had said, meeting that woman in the airport where she was at that's going to be a heck of a lot easier to do when we can meet ourselves mm -hmm. exactly where we're at. Yeah. And that's, that's a tall order, but it, it happens moment to moment. And I think feeling into 
is what I'm doing right now, does it bring me joy? Does it fill my heart? And even if it's mundane or whatever it is, can, can you find, if we're talking about a principle of yoga, contentment in all things? Doesn't mean you have to be, oh, all happy, rah, rah about it, but can you be content? It's like Buddhism. Yes. Yeah, happiness doesn't mean that you don't have suffering. It just right. means that you can Hell no. <laughs> plow through the suffering because you know that you know, there's happiness right. in the midst of that. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. All right. This, I feel like we could, I could just talk to you lovely ladies <laughs> for so long because you're such, you're just, you're beautiful women. You have, you're doing amazing work in the world. You have so much to share. What I want you to share <laughs> is, and this is, just, it's, I'm building it up like it's really exciting, but it's not that exciting. What is like your, your go-to best quick tip in the kitchen? Oh, I know we'll have different ones, which is great. Okay. Um, my, my tip, actually, I've been saying this a lot in, um, on my presentations lately, is I actually think anybody who's new, new to vegan or plant-based cooking, I want them to grab a piece of paper and a pen and write down the five things they loved eating when they were young or that are family memories or food memories or cultural food um, favorites and write them down and then challenge themselves to veganize it because that means that they'll start to Google and research and find egg replacers mm. and cheese replacers and can make a dish that's like, see, I can eat something that made me happy and warm and reminds me of grandma. And it's the compassionate version of it because it's a reminder that our food isn't weird or different. Well, it is different. It's not weird and it's not hard to make. It's just finding that way to do it, that, uh, that eat something you loved that aligns with your current ethics. I love that. I like that a lot because that's people taking ownership of the food that they're putting. Like they're taking ownership of it. They're actually like going out and discovering this process versus just, you know, doing what they always did, having mom's uh, banana nut bread, right? right? Yes. Which we have veganized. We have veganized yeah. and it's amazing, we right? upped but the vibe exactly. too. We had to take out the cocaine sugar. <laughs> but that's putting, you're putting them in, you're putting them in the Grand Canyon. Exactly. You're telling them like, you got to go figure this out, yeah. how to do it. But I you're, that. you're placing love. them in a foundation of love. Mm -hmm. right. What did you love? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And now go explore that. Mm -hmm. That's what it. Oh, I love that because one of the quite. I had we have covered everything that I wanted to talk to, you, but there's you know some people can be. Somebody told me the other day petrified to go in the kitchen. Well, that's a great way to remove that that belief system right there. What did you love? Mm -hmm. Because we all know at this table that you can make it vegan. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to say you can even make it better. I think so, too. Yeah. <laughs> and you mentioned banana bread. There is a to live for banana bread Ooh. in our cookbook. Oh, Vicky's, right? Yes. yes. It has um, chocolate chips. It has cherries. And interestingly enough, this particular uh, recipe creator, uh, Vicki Brett Gotch of uh, Ann Arbor Vegan Kitchen, is of, of the stricter, oil-free kind of way of doing this. And yet... You taste this banana bread and it's like, oh, come on. <laughs> but yeah, it's oil-free, sugar-free, all that stuff. And really, really good. So my tip is about intuition. That I love hearing Dr. Greger, who is the one I'm thinking of right now, who will say, well, why else would you make your food choices other than looking at the science? And it's like, well, yeah, you know, you're a scientist. That's where you would look. That's certainly a valid place to look. But... I'm not that. I'm a spiritual seeker. And so even though I know about the science and I acknowledge phytochemicals and antioxidants and colorful foods and all that, my real go-to for choosing food is intuition. What am I leaning toward now? Now, if I had the whole world, you know, if I was an omnivore and there was all kinds of pork and, you know, meringue pies and stuff like that, it might be a little tricky for the intuition because then it would have to filter some of that stuff that really is not what my body really wants. But when I can see the color, you know, sometimes in the morning, like I'll really want a smoothie and I'm really into wild blueberries these days. I've gotten into the medical medium. Do you guys know his work? Yes. Oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. Amazing guy. So wild blueberries. I think I know of thing. him because of you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And but sometimes it's like, no, it's cold. I don't want frozen blueberries in anything. So I'll make my Ayurvedic chocolate shake that's got cinnamon and cloves and cardamom and even a little bit of red pepper. 
So that's going to warm me for when I go outside. And so I think to everybody, you really can trust yourself. And particularly if you've already committed to being vegan. So you've gotten rid of the animal stuff. And a lot of the so-called junk food has got animal stuff in it. So that's gone too. And so from within this wonderful, wonderful array of the plant kingdom and also some of the processed foods that people have made that are vegan, that do enable us to have some of the things that we miss, you've got a beautiful place to go to choose. And when you're there, just let your intuition say, hmm, I think I want that. I think... Trusting our intuition is, it could very well be the single most important thing that we could do for ourselves because it will direct us in in every facet of our life. That's beautiful. Great place to end. Thank you so much, ladies. Thank you for having us. Lady and gentlemen. Awesome. (laughs) Fabulous. I love these ladies and their insight is so valuable. Navigating multivore homes is such a big one for people and I hope their stories were helpful to those of you who are living amongst split kitchens. Thank you so much for tuning in. There are so many ways to support the show that don't cost you a thing. Subscribe on Apple Podcasts. That one is huge. Also, please leave a review on iTunes. Visit the show notes and use the banner ads for Amazon, Thrive Market, set up your 30-day free trial. Share this episode on your social outlets outlets and spread the love. If you are ready to deepen your participation, you can become a supporter on Patreon, where for as little as a few bucks a month, you get access to sneak peeks, exclusives, and extras. Thank you, Jody. She is our newest patron. We so appreciate your support. And now she has access to not only over 40 of these exclusives, but also the yoga practices that we have posted. Another one is coming over the next few weeks. We just recorded it the other day. Okay, you guys. Yep. We are in the hustle and that's what living the dream is. But this is how we buy our food and this is how we pay our bills and this is how we keep a roof over our head. And we know you have choices. So we are in deep thanks for your support and for choosing Yogi Triathlete. Living purpose is not glam and glitz. It requires steadfastness, detachment, compassion, and forgiveness. It is the goat path. It is against the grain. But what I can say is that no effort on this path is a waste. Get quiet, be still, and become brave enough to allow your gifts to surface and be shared. This is the Awake and Ready Life, and this is the exact thing that our world is crying out for in this very moment.